Welcome to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am and we are so pleased that you have chosen and joined with us this morning. And we are in family whichever you are. As a family, we care your health and your family and your neighbor. Please wear your mask and social distance when you go outside. Please wash your hand when you're from outside. May the peace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Almighty God as we receive this morning's prelude. Please join with me, call to worship this morning. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear enlightening the eyes. 
The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Please join with me, call to confession, solemn prayer, and assurance of God's pardon. The Lord's law is indeed perfect, God's decrees sure and precept right. Yet in our sin and finitude, we fell short and fail to follow God's commandment. Nonetheless, the Lord is gracious merciful and abounding in steadfast love, confident that God's promises are sure, God's character unchanging. We dare to confess our sin in order that we might be forgiven from the past we cannot change and freed for God's good future. Let us pray. Lord, as we prepare to break the bread and drink from the cup, we cannot help but hesitate to partake of your body and blood. We remember your admonishment to go and be reconciled to our siblings before coming to your table. We recognize how we have fanned the flames of division rather than repaired the breach between us. We know we do not make evident our unity in you, our oneness made possible through your sacrifice. Too many of your children do not have a place at the table, do not have enough to eat, are relegated to beg for crumbs when, we com when you command us to offer radical <clears throat> and abundant hospitality. In your relentless mercy, forgive us, free us from fear, and make us conduits for your reconciling love. Amen.
God refused to give up on us. God restored us. God sent the only Son to save us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, believe the good news. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Peace of the Lord Jesus Christ Jesus be with you. Peace of God be with you today and every day. The peace, peace of Christ, Christ be, be with you. you. Peace, peace be with you here in California. California. Peace be with Peace be with you. And now our reading from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss, because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. We're continuing today the readings from Exodus Today, Exodus 20, beginning with the first verse. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now when all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and, and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak for us and, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. So then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Here ends our reading from the 20th chapter of Exodus, verses 1 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Ten Commandments. We have come to the time in the book of Exodus to hear the Ten Commandments. Uh, everybody is, knows about the Ten Commandments, and, and our forefathers in the faith uh, used those as, as one of the primary teaching tools. The Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments were, were taught to children and adults. So the Ten Commandments are familiar to us, and yet they're not. They, they have become... Uh, almost empty symbols over the years. But first of all, as if we should notice that 
The Ten Commandments are important in the story of the Exodus. In Exodus 19, prior to our reading today, God tells Moses to tell the people to prepare themselves. For two days, they are to wash all their clothes in themselves. They are to refrain from any sexual activity. They are to prepare themselves to meet the Lord. They are now at Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and they are to come before the mountain. Not too close. Don't cross this uh, barrier that is there, because if they do, they will die. But they are to come to the mountain and to hear the word of the Lord. So the Ten Commandments are important in the story of the Exodus from leaving Egypt to arriving at Mount Sinai to heading on eventually to the Promised Land. Ten Commandments are important. But, but, over the years, the commandments have become an, an, an empty symbol. And it's interesting how that, that could happen. In the 1920s, Cecil B. DeMille uh, produced a, a, a blockbuster movie of the Ten Commandments, and it had included the story of the Exodus and then a modern-day story of how people lived or primarily did not live according to the Ten Commandments. But then after World War II, Cecil B. DeMille was determined to produce a second movie, The Ten Commandments, and it was even more impressive than his first. But this time, the focus was more on Moses and less on the commandments themselves. Famous actors and actresses, thousands of people, spectacular sound effects and, and uh, special effects that, that somehow made this a, a really tremendous movie. But you know, there, there's something else about how that movie became such a symbol and the Ten Commandments became a symbol. There's a new book, well, it's been out a couple of years, called Set in Stone. And it's the history of the Ten Commandments in America. Not their meaning, not how the Lord speaks to us through them, but, but how people interpret it or, or use the commandments. And the writer talks about Cecil B. DeMille and the Ten Commandments uh, in 19, I think, 56. He was a smart guy, and he allied himself with a group called the Order of the Eagle. They were a group that, that uh, helped all kinds of, of social service projects, but they were also patriotic. So they tied in with the movie, and they decided to provide replicas, monuments to the Ten Commandments all over the country, hundred or more placed in the cities around the country. So we had commerce, business, tied with patriotism, tied with religion, and all of that came together. In the 50s, there was the beginning of, of a great deal of anxiety that although we have survived World War II, now we were facing nuclear destruction. Now we were facing communism, atheistic communism in Russia and China and elsewhere. And, and the Ten Commandments came to be seen not simply as part of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, but as a symbol of America's piety, a symbol of America standing under God, one nation under God. 
with liberty and justice for all. One nation under God. And, and the Ten Commandments came to be that symbol. Jews, Christians could come together in what came to be called the Judeo-Christian tradition. Whether we were Jewish or Christian, Protestant or Catholic, we were all Americans under God. So the Ten Commandments came to be a symbol, a symbol of patriotism as well as piety. Business, patriotism, religion, all getting intermingled. Most people thought that was a good idea at the time. There, there were a few people that complained, people that complained about separation of church and state and did not want the Ten Commandments put on the courthouse square. Uh, there, were, there were some other criticisms, but generally it was, it was approved. But you have to think about that. We're not called upon to, to think of the Ten Commandments as a symbol of our country. We listen as the Word of God. Sometimes symbols themselves can be true, but they become empty. Uh, they, they become uh, a substitute for the reality rather than a reflection of the reality. And I think that's what happened to the Ten Commandments. As monuments were placed all over the country with the Ten Commandments, there, there did not seem to be any revival of religion or any adherence to the commandments themselves. They were just there. They were just there. Uh, we could think of another symbol uh, of the Bible. We as Christians believe the Bible is God's word for us. But just holding up a Bible in our hand does not somehow say that we're Christian or that we believe in the authority of the Bible. The Bible has to be open and, and read, not just, just held up, right? I, I still remember years ago, I saw a Billy Graham crusade on television. And uh, Billy Graham was holding up his Bible, and but you could see from the camera angle that he was not reading from the Bible. He was reading from his manuscript. Now, did that mean that the sermon was not biblical? No, of course not. Billy Graham preached a biblical sermon, but the Bible he held up was just a symbol. It, it was not the reality. The reality was sharing God's word. The Bible became a symbol, and for many people it was an empty symbol. People said, I believe in the Bible. The Bible says but they did not necessarily ever open the Bible and read the Bible. I happened to hear a professor talk about uh, a book he'd written some years ago called Flea Market Jesus. He had interviewed people at the flea market and mostly people who were um, very poor and, and often very uneducated uh, and what was interesting, he said, was these people had a very strong sense of belief in God, belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, belief in the authority of Scripture, belief in miracles, belief in the resurrection, but they were not in any way connected to churches. They were not active in a church. They did not listen to television evangelists or radio. They did not read Christian magazines or books. They were totally disconnected from, from any community of faith. And yet they, they had a strong traditional faith, including the authority of Scripture. And yet, as he interviewed them, they never read the Bible. 
their, their faith was apparently something they learned as children and it stuck with them, but it didn't compel them to join a church, to, to reach out. I, I think that sense of the Bible as an empty symbol, an unread symbol, is, is carries over to the sense of the Ten Commandments and particularly monuments that we might place in various uh, courthouse squares or the Capitol grounds. Now, I'm not trying to get into the question of church and state separation. I'm simply pointing out that sometimes symbols, rather than helping us live out our faith, serve as vaccinations that inoculate us from that faith. And that's kind of what happened with the Ten Commandments. People put the monuments up and they said, we believe in the Ten Commandments. We are a religious nation, particularly in contrast to atheistic communism. We are a religious nation, but we don't pay any attention to it, right? And think about that. If you believe in the Bible being the Word of God, you believe that, that the Ten Commandments were a significant gift of God, then you have to ask, why do we not pay more attention to them? For example, you should not make any graven images, right? Well, what about all the statues we have all over the place? Well, people say, well, those aren't graven images. But if you go to a Muslim country and you look around, you will not see representations of humans or animals, will you? Because they take this commandment very, very seriously. We say we believe in the Ten Commandments, but maybe not that one. And then we say we believe in, in honoring the Sabbath, but clearly in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is the seventh day. There are Seventh-day Adventists and some other Christian groups that honor the seventh day. But most of us honor the first day of the week because it's the day of resurrection. We are celebrating Easter every Sunday we kind of bring over some of the ideas of the Sabbath and rest and not working, but that's, that's not in the Ten Commandments. It says the seventh day, not the first. And I think we have good reason for not honoring the seventh day. But the point is we have interpreted and adjusted and rearranged much of our understanding from the Ten Commandments. We do not simply honor them as they were written. So what should we do? What should we do if we go beyond thinking of the commandment as, as an, a, a symbol of some kind of vague religiosity, some vague kind of combination of patriotism and religion that, that believes in some vague kind of God? What should we do? Well, first of all, it helps if we would simply read what is said. It begins with, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The commandments are not, first of all, some kind of transaction where we have a list that if we can pass this test, then God will love us. God makes it very plain to the Israelites that he has been caring for them all along. 
I am the Lord. I am the one that instituted Passover. I am the one that parted the sea for you to get safely across. I am the one that provided water in the wilderness, manna and quail and, and more water. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who has saved you. And as Christians, we can say something very similar. It's not that we have to meet seven steps in order to be saved, five purposes in order to get to heaven. It is that we know, we know the grace of God at work in our lives. We know God's care for us. And because God has filled us with his love, his spirit, we want to live our life for him as best we can. The commandments then are not a burden placed on the Israelites or placed on us as Christians. They are God's gracious guidance for helping us to live as God wants us to live, as we live our best selves. Sometimes, sometimes we forget that God is the one who brought the people out of Egypt. God is the one who cares for us in Jesus Christ. In that little book, Set in Stone, that talked about Cecil DeMille, they also talked about some other interesting <clears throat> experiences in, in history. And one of them was a, a Jewish synagogue in New York City in the 1850s. It, it had come into a lot of money. There were a lot of new Jewish immigrants. And so they wanted to build a, a, a new building. And in that building, they, they had a stained glass window. Uh, we Christians would call it a rose window because it was a circular window, but it had the Ten Commandments. And rather than being two tablets that you read about in Exodus, the Ten Commandments were in a circle moving around, uh, one through ten, but they weren't numbered, so you, you could start anywhere you wanted to, as it were. A and that generated a lot of controversy within the congregation. That wasn't right, they said. But by then, they had spent all their money on the building and the stained glass window. They couldn't afford to take it out and start over. So they finally came to a compromise. They, they built a, a more traditional two tablet Ten Commandments, and they put it by the ark. So you still had the stained glass, but now you had the more traditional um, representation of the Ten Commandments. Does that matter? Is that just an odd fact of history? I, I think the congregation had a point. Because when we think of the two tablets, we recognize that the first four, depending on how you count, the first four focus on God. The last six focus on our relationship with one another. So you can see in the New Testament how Jesus could talk about the whole sum of the law being loving the Lord your God with all you have and then loving your neighbor as yourself. Jumbling them all up as if they were all equal somehow is confusing because we must start at the beginning. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me or instead of me. I am the Lord your God, you only. We serve the Lord. Martin Luther said that whatever we hold most dear is our God. 
And, and so I think even though we would claim we have no idols and, and we do not worship other gods than the Lord God, actually in truth, there are many gods in our lives, whether it's fame or fortune or patriotism, there are many other gods that we serve and the commandments say to us, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. And then the second part of the law follows naturally from that. The second part of the law relating to one another comes from our love for God and our acknowledgement of God's love for us. And because God loves us, we can love one another and serve one another. The Ten Commandments could easily be preached over 10 weeks, one commandment per week. We have simply tried to look at this from what might be considered an airplane view. Look, look at this from the whole and recognize, first of all, that, that the commandments in Exodus are important because of the way God told the people to purify themselves and, and come to the mountain they are important in that they call for the worship of the Lord God and Him alone. And empty symbols that, that say we believe but are simply a, a kind of vague religiosity is not what God is calling for here. God is calling for us to give of ourselves, love Him, love neighbor, as we love ourselves. Listen, listen for God's word. Let us pray. Gracious God, our heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that you have shared your will and your good news with your people centuries ago and even to this day. Lord God, you have set us free and unburdened us that we may joyfully, gladly seek to do your will for us. Use us Guide us by your Spirit. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we know that we live by your grace. And so we lift up this day, a member of our congregation in particular need. We pray, Lord, that you will be with Bob through surgery and convalescence, that you will be with Jan and the whole family as they seek to support and encourage Bob in the illness and in the recovery. Be with all of us, we pray, O Lord, as we together bear one another's burdens and support one another in particular need. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. According to the Gospel according to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with the disciples in Emmaus, he took bread, blessed it and broke it, gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized their Lord. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all who trust in him to share the feast that he has prepared for us. Presbyterian Church Book of Order says that the opportunity to eat and drink with Christ is not a right bestowed upon the worthy, but a privilege given to the undeserving who come to the table in faith, repentance, and love. Come, come share in the banquet. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. O Lord, our God, creator of the universe, you formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. <clears throat> you sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the faithful of every time and place who say to the glory of your name, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Thank you for Jesus, for his teaching and healing, for his challenging and feeding, for his living and dying and rising, that we might be raised with him and all the world made new. We thank you that on the night before he died, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and shared with his friends. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and wine, gifts of the good earth, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, dedicated to your service, for great is the mystery of faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your gathered people and on these gifts, bread and wine of earth, to body and blood of heaven, our frail flesh and blood to your holy people, <clears throat> that we might be Christ's body to your world. For this world we now pray, aid our response to the coronavirus, heal the gap of social isolation, cure disease, 
and protect our leaders and officials. End all war. Mend your wounded earth. Heal those who suffer. Comfort those who mourn. And infuse us with your peace that is rooted in what is just. Through the power of your spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another <clears throat> as we work and wait in hope. Confident in that day when Christ will come to make all things well, and we will feast together at his heavenly table. All glory and honor are yours, holy God, through Christ and in the unity of the Spirit, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. As Jesus taught his disciples, let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread, and drink this cup. You proclaim the same death of the risen Lord until he comes. Mystery in Christ's name, I take this bread which has been blessed and broken and say to you, take and eat. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and says, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Pour out for many, pour out for many for the remission of the sin. All of you drink of it. This is the body of Christ for you. Here is bread that speaks and this is blood of Christ for you. He broke for a guilty world. For a guilty world. Hungry we come to feed on you. Let us pray. Gracious and abandoned God, as we wait for the fulfillment of your desires for your creation, even now at this table and in this meal, you have met us in Christ. We thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and quenching our thirst with the cup of salvation. As we have been nourished and strengthened here, Send us out into the world by the power of your Holy Spirit to share your life and salvation with all whom we meet. Amen.
We've gathered together today, even if by electronics, to be strengthened in fellowship, to stand under God's word, to be nourished at God's table. We're glad you were with us today. We pray you'll join again next Sunday as we, as this part of God's people, join together in worship and praise. And as we go through this week, we pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion, fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with each one of us, with, with all of us together, day by day. Amen. shine your light in the way we live send us out in the power of your spirit as we've received may we freely give send us out send us out send us out for your out in the power of your spirit to show your love everywhere we go send us out in the power of your spirit lord fill us up so we overflow send us out